you, Hayden, Kaysen, Gabby, and Aiden, for that beautiful music. It's great to have uh, some variety, and we appreciate you guys stepping in this Sabbath. Well, good morning and welcome. We've got our couches full today, and we're social distancing. One more week of, uh, of social distancing. I hear that the barbers are going to open this week, so maybe I won't look like I'm from the 70s next week. Get a little haircut, maybe. We'll see. But... Um, we're so glad that you're here with us this Sabbath morning. Let's bow our heads and pray uh, before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us. You say that wherever two or three are gathered, you are there also, Lord. And that's true right here, right now in this disaster, in this pandemic. We know that there are Sabbath schools all over Johnson County and all over the world meeting today. One, two, and three. And you know we know that you are there, and we praise you for that. Now as we open your word, feed us, Lord. Give us strength. Give us hope as we look at your church going through a crisis period and see how it's relevant in our lives today, Lord. We love you, and we thank you for loving us first. Amen. Okay, our mission story has been focused in Europe. Um, so we are there again, and we are in Finland today. And Isabella and I were kind of trying to figure out how to pronounce, and we think it's Pikio, maybe, in the bottom of Finland, down in this island area. Down, um, you can see Turku, and you can see it on the big map there. And these are some scenes of this beautiful part of the country. So, Isabella, why don't you tell us the story from Pikio? Turning 12 was a big year for Siv Sylvia Lepala. She started seventh grade at a new school in Finland. She stopped attending church with her parents. She smoked her first cigarette and drank her first alcohol. One day, Sylvia was walking with a group of friends in the town of Pikio. As they talked and laughed, another 12-year-old girl pulled out a pack of cigarettes. Look, I have some cigarettes, the girl said. Do you want to try? Sylvia had never smoked, and she didn't know what to say. She looked at the girl. She glanced over at her friends, some, uh, her friends. Some of them were smoking. They stared at her and waited for her to reply. Sylvia was afraid they would make fun of her if she refused or even stopped being her friend. Sure, I'll smoke one, she said. The cigarette smoke did not taste good at all, and Sylvia coughed, but she smiled. She felt she was cool. Several weeks later, a friend came to Sylvia's house for the night. The two girls were alone in the bedroom after father and mother had gone to sleep. The friend opened her purse and pulled out a bottle of vodka. Let's try this, she exclaimed. Where did you get that from, Sylvia asked, surprised that a 12-year-old girl could buy alcohol at a store. The friend looked guilty. I stole it from my parents' cupboard, she whispered. Do you want to try? Sylvia didn't know anything about vodka. Sure, she said. Sylvia felt the same as when she had smoked. She felt she was cool. Friends offered Sylvia cigarettes and alcohol many more times that school year. Every time, she found it easier to say yes. Sometimes, she asked for cigarettes or alcohol. She wanted to feel cool. She began to smoke and drink more and more. Several years passed, and she found it hard to study. She felt sad all the time. She cried every night and often during the day. Then she remembered God and cried out in desperation. Please, God, I don't want to be depressed anymore. One day, her parents invited her to go to a prayer meeting at the Adventist Church in Pikio, Finland Junior College. Her parents weren't Adventist, but they liked to go to Christian programs. Sylvia listened to people sing about Jesus. She prayed. When she left the prayer meeting, she was crying. She wanted to know more about God. The next morning, she found a Bible at home and read a chapter. She read another chapter the next morning and the next. When friends called her to go drinking, she refused. She knew that they were a bad influence on her, and she would be tempted to drink and smoke if she joined them. She didn't want to drink and smoke anymore. It didn't feel cool. But after a while, friends stopped calling. But Sylvia wasn't sad. She had found something better. She was with Jesus. Today, Sylvia is 23 and is studying to become a physical therapist in Finland's capital, Helsinki? I don't know. Yeah. She has many Adventist friends, and they cook and feed the needy at an Adra soup kitchen. Sylvia warns other children to stay away from alcohol and cigarettes. I wish I would have been stronger to say no when I was offered alcohol or cigarettes, she said. It's not good for my health, and it's not cool. It really isn't. Thank you, Isabella. That's a beautiful story with a good message. It's a lot easier to say no the first time than to get hooked on, um, on things that will put you in chains and rule you for the rest of your life. So I'm glad that Sylvia was able to make that choice. 
Okay, so our power text today come from, comes from Ephesians 2, 19 to 20. Let's say it together. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Okay, Jesus. Jesus is the reason we do all of this. He's the reason we get up and and live he is he is our our cornerstone that cornerstone that holds and sets the building that everything is measured off of in our lives um it was very very important before the days of computers and they set that cornerstone and then measured everything off of it to get a, a solid building so jesus is our cornerstone well as i told you guys last week our lesson today is titled, entitled, Christ Folk, Experiencing God's Love in Our Church as It Grows. And we're continuing to follow in the book of Acts, the journey of Paul, and how Christianity is spreading throughout the region. So we've got an exciting story today. Um, let's look at the map first. And over here we see Jerusalem, down on the bottom right hand of the side of the map. And so in our verses today, we specifically reference Antioch up here, uh, Cyprus, the, the um, it looks like I missed an A there, it should be Phoenicia, it should be this portion right here, and also we reference um, Cyrene all the way down here. Who was from Cyrene? Someone Barnabas? of... Barnabas? Not Barnabas. Simon. Simon, Simon of Cyrene, that's right. Barnabas may have been, I don't know, but there's Cyrene. So we'll look at, in just a middle, I'll, minute, I'll have another map for you that'll show you kind of how it spread. It's really cool. But just so in our reading today, you can get a, um, oh, look, there's the A. I just found it. Looks like I didn't make the box wide enough and it dropped the A up there. But um, Paul and Barnabas are going to be teaching in this area right here uh, in our verses today. So if you guys would, uh, you can open your Bibles to Acts 11, 19 and 30. And you guys at home, I, I hope that you open your swords up and are following along with us. We'll be reading out of the New King James Version today. But I hope you guys are following along too. Yeah, Annabella? Absolutely. Okay, we're going to start in verse 19. And let's go ahead and read down to verse 21. Okay. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen that arose over Stephen traveled <coughs> um, as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching only preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. Some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Okay. So remember, there was persecution in Jerusalem, and everybody spread out. Okay. So, um, does anybody know who the Hellenists were? Not Jews? Well, remember, God wanted Israel to be the light for the world. He wanted them to spread his love all over the world. That was the original plan. It didn't go work out so well. So the, the Jews, at, at different times, they had gone to Babylon. They'd gone through the different captivities all over, and some of those stayed. That's how we get the story of Esther and others. So the Hellenists were, were Jews that were in, in, um, in the region of Greece, and they primarily spoke uh, Greek. Um, so... We've got, um, at first, who did, who, did they, um, who did they tell the good news to at first? Like only, in only the Jews. 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 So why do you think that was? Um, I guess because like, they thought the Jews were God's people, so they thought like, we, sh they, we, sh we should only preach this message to 
the Jews because like they also thought like the gen because like I guess like they thought other people were not worthy I guess to hear God's Pagans. message. Okay. Up until Pagans. This point Pagans. Yeah. Pagans. Yeah. Up started? until this point, everybody else had been like. Every religion has been exclusive to a race. It has been this religion is for this race and this and this and, this. and so it's kind of a stereotype that they haven't broken yet and maybe it explodes, maybe not. Okay. And so think about you guys in your family. If you're going to tell a story that's really family centric, is it easier to tell it to one of your brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandparents? Or is it easier to go downtown Dallas and just start telling it to someone on the street? Probably your family Probably members. Probably your family, family members. Because it's like a story about your family. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to tell strangers facts about your own family. Well, there's that, but there's also the fact that if you're telling it to the Jews, if you're telling it to your family, they already have the background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they so they can un understand it more easily. Right, yeah. right, and right. And you have to explain it to other people. Exactly. So that it gives you a chance to explain God's love for them. And it's like yeah. an inside joke. Nobody gets it but the person it was intended for. Yeah. And like the disciples did with the children, we already see that they're not patient because like when the children came to Jesus, they just sh shooed them away and said, we don't have time for this. So we can already see that they're not patient. Yeah, there's yeah. a strong first impression. And, and in your family, let's say you had a very, very talented or rich Uncle Bob, okay? <laughs> and he lives, let's say he lives in Europe, and he keeps promising, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring you guys a lot of money. And he, he's promised the family this for, for decades. And if you finally get the news that Uncle Bob has come, your family's going to know that. Yeah. Strangers, they're going to like, who's Uncle Bob? <laughs> they don't know he's rich. They don't know if he's talented. The family's going to know that. And so they were sp preaching to the Jews, hey, our Messiah has finally come with all that entails, which mm -hmm. they thought he was going to set up an earthly kingdom. But so telling, telling the other people, they've got to tell them why we're waiting for the Messiah why the Messiah means so much. You have to start the story all over again. That's right. That's right. Okay. Which meant that they had to start all the way at the beginning. That's right. Because and I think, I think starting at the beginning probably helped them more than just telling the inside joke part. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you start at the beginning, you have to start in the beginning. That's, that's exactly right, Rayleigh. In the beginning, God created the earth. That's why we're here. If you don't believe that, then it's a little hard to believe the other stuff. Okay, so um, verse 21, it said, The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. So Jesus had promised to send what? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit is, is permeating everything that, that the apostles touch. Yeah, Brady. So Hold that mic up close. Um, I've, me and my family have been reading a chapter of Genesis every night, and okay. um, but um, now that I'm reading it slowly, like you've heard the story of creation, uh -huh. but then you hear it again, and it means more. That's right. And every time I learn something new, like it's just every time, and. So, when um, when I hear stories in the Bible, I hear them from a personal standpoint. That's right. And um, so people, they heard it from one disciple, but when they hear it from another, they learn something new. So, if you tell them more than once, it's better than if you just tell them, hey, he's coming, and then move on to the next person. Because it means more every time. It does. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing. And opening the word with you guys, I bring, uh, when I open the word with you guys, we bring Charlie's perspective and Braley's perspective and Isabella's perspective, Annabella's perspective. And if you think about perspective, it's everything that's happened to you in your life. And so you use that to interpret God, God's word with the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so beautiful to study Bible, the Bible with your family, with your friends, because everybody brings what God is talking to them 
through their personal experience in life. Thank you for sharing that, Bradley. That's that's beautiful. Okay, let's go on to. Um, would so you like to read? Uh, let's go ahead and and read verses twenty three, twenty two through twenty four. Okay. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to come as far as An- to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and with great and a great many people were added to the Lord. Okay, so Barnabas comes up. He's heard a couple of things, but when he sees it, oh, what does it say? He was encouraged and he was glad whenever he saw the true working of the Holy Spirit. And think about how hard it would be to encourage the son of encouragement. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the postal system, the, the Christian postal system. These guys were worried about what was happening in Oklahoma. It's about probably... Oh, okay. And so prob- they walked to Oklahoma. Well, they sent Barnabas to encourage and to check it out because the apostles wanted to know. So the church, the church, it wasn't just what's happening in my town. They were worried about what's happening in Oklahoma and California and Africa and Europe. And they, they were writing letters to each other. And we'll see a little bit later that and they were really supporting each other. And they're like moving from continent to continent. But the only way you can really move is horse, donkey, or feet. Yep, or camel. I feel like the only way you can move is on your feet or someone else's feet. <laughs> <laughs> yep, something else's feet. Um, okay, so Barnabas there uh, was there and... So let's see what happens next. Braley, would you read 25 and 26? Let's see what happens next. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Okay. So Barnabas saw a good work. He said, wow, the Holy Spirit's working here. So he runs over and gets Saul. How long did they stay there? A year. A, a year. year. That's right. That means not that they were sitting there a year. That means that for the entire year, there was always a new person to tell. Oh, yeah. And yeah. retell the story to others, so it means more. Yeah. So we know our friend Paul slash Saul is he a verb or a noun, his personality? Is he a man of action or is he... Action, because yeah. he like persecuted action. all the Jews and then like he came and they were all scared and then he's like, Either no, I'm on your side now. Either way, in both times, he thought he was doing it for God and he took a huge action on what he believed was God and... He didn't really stop to listen to he, what I, God I don't, actually I think was. he did change his perspective, but he definitely didn't change his approach. Okay. Yeah. Well, we know from last week, we studied about how God uses our talents, and he changes us and puts us in situations so that we can use our talents that we already have. So we know that that was one of Saul's talents. So what I'm getting at here is I don't think he stayed in Antioch for a whole year vacationing by the sea. No. I think there was work Definitely to do, not. and I think he was doing the work of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what else do we see in verse 26 that's interesting? They assembled with the church and taught a great many people. So they, they like, kind of joined forces with they the church. They joined forces, yeah. Yeah. And also the fact they were first called Christians in Antioch. And, you know... It's e- an all-year camp meeting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Even though, even though they're Christians and they believe in Christ, there's really nothing that separates them. If you look at the rest of the Bible, when we look at the Old Testament, it's still very meaningful to us. So they could assemble with the Jews, and they were still family. There was still a commonality there. They still believed everything, the Jews. The, the Jews kind of went off on a tangent and weren't ready for Jesus, but if they had stayed in the Bible with what God had said, 
Jesus is, the Jews would have flowed right into Christianity. It was all even designed to be it, one line. Even if you say it, technically Abraham and all the previous ones, they were Christians too because Absolutely. they were looking forward to Christ. Absolutely. So it was very natural for them to be in the synagogues and churches. It, it was home to them. So that, that, what else do we see in 26? That end, end uh, statement there. Um. I think she said it. And the disciples are first called Christians in Antioch. Okay, yeah, well, what that. were they called before this? Jews. Like the Jews? Like people oh, the Christ. people of the way. The way, yeah. that's right. They were called the way. So they were first called Christians at Antioch. And in my, whoops, in my study. Dad, get control Yeah, we're, we're back to where we need to be. In my study, um, Ellen White tells us that God specifically chose the name Christian um, for his new church. Yeah, Brady? So, um, people of the way, um, um, it's like Yahweh. So, because we had a week of prayer and it's... We did a there, there's a way, yeah. no way, uh -huh. yes way. I never we thought of that. I like it. I like it. So why do you, so God chose that name. Why do you think it was natural for the people to call them Christians? Because they were in Christ, Christ in. I would say mm -hmm. that whenever you call something an in, it's like you're changing it from uh, who it is, and then you're instead applying a label and saying that this person is this. And so they're saying these people are literally reflecting Christ in every way. Oh, yeah. And maybe they wanted to just give them a better name than people of the way, okay. and then just give them the name Christian. So, so Christianity really encompassed everything they talked about. It was, they bled Christianity, they talked Christianity, they ate Christianity. Everything they did was Christianity. It was all about Christ. So, I pray today that we can be called Christians not because we say we're Christians but because we're talking about Christ all the time and because we're sharing the good news okay let's move on to um, verse 27 um, so a, a footnote there about 25 and 26 though is that um, Saul and Barnabas were actually ordained at this time They'd been doing the good work, but the leaders actually came to, to them and ordained them. So they Ellen weren't White like tells us. officially disciples. Right. They were consecrated for this work because they were doing such a faithful work of it. Okay. 27. Let's do 27 through... Th who wants to read? Charlie? Okay. Let's go ahead and do 27 through 30. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judah. This they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Okay. So there was a famine in the whole world? Yeah, and where else... Was that the one? No. Where else do we see that? Egypt? Um, in, I'm sorry? In from Egypt. The one from Egypt. Yeah, the, and that one was, remember, that one was before the Israelites yeah. even went up, before they were, oh, okay. went up to Canaan. So there's several different times, but. Even so, a famine always kind of seems to be God's way of saying, I exist. I'm helping it's you. It's like <laughs> he wanted another way to send a flood. Because he promised not to send a flood. It's basically like the no I would eating version of a flood. Even so, basically. though, if God yeah. promises not to send a flood, he already knows he's not going to send a flood. And so I would say it's more of his way of uh, a halfway point. It's not as bad as a flood, but it is. Okay. Well, if you look at from our lesson last week, God came and stopped Saul with a bright light. This famine may be a, a way of getting people's attention and the bringing light. them back, just like it was in Egypt. The, the famine in Egypt under Joseph 
God used that like in a mighty way. Reunited his family. So, oh can you guys think of anything in modern times that has just been a earthquake, a shock to society? COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen. The whole world is awake and listening right now. The whole world has had a flash of light and they're sitting there on straight street with their eyes blinded. Nobody knows what to do, where to go. So I Nobody predict can do anything though. I predict that God will use this COVID nineteen in a mighty way. And the changes you will see now, the, the seeds that are being planted now, we can't even imagine what God is going to do. Yeah, Brady. So um, there's this picture on Instagram, and it says um, it's the devil and the Lord having a conversation. And the devil says, um, I've closed all your churches. And then God says, yes, but I've opened one in every home. Amen. Amen. And really, in the Garden of Eden... The church was the family, and God God uses that family meta metaphor of Christ, the husband, the wife, and the children growing up and unified. So, so God's going to use this just like He used here. God wants the, I suppose you call them ropes of love everywhere, not just family, but everybody needs to not just sure. your church, not just your family, but everybody. That's right. So the um. What did the Christians do for the believers in Judea? Um, oh, they sent relief. Yeah, they sent relief. They sent relief, yeah, they sent okay? Relief. This is Christians caring for Christians, not Christians eating Christians, <laughs> not Christians saying, good, we're done with Jerusalem. Let's, those guys are so stuck up down there, we're going to move the church to Antioch. No. <laughs> No, they're not rejoicing in the suffering. They're sending relief. And we see earlier, what did the people in Judea do to Antioch? As soon as they found out that Antioch existed, they started sending people to Antioch to help. That's right. Yeah. So it's an ebb and a flow. It's, it's the body of Christ helping each other. It's so beautiful. What goes in must come out. That's right. That's right. So... Um, There are three underlying t um, um, lessons I want you guys to get from this reading. The first is Christians helping Christians, the support. The second is um, the ordination of Paul and Barnabas, the, the consecration of those people that are working under the Holy Spirit. And the third thing is the carrying of the word, taking what Christ has done for us to the world on a person-by-person -person, uh, level. So beautiful. Okay, so um, there's another map of the dis dispersion of the Jews and how um, God's word just spread through all over. And if we remember, one of the reasons that God had set up, God is so beautiful, he had set up the Roman Empire to r rule all of this. It was the Pax Romana, or the Roman peace, so Rome had built roads. They secured the land so it was safe to travel. And so it allowed the gospel to spread. And what the Jews saw as the Romans as an oppression, Christ and God were using to save the world. So what, just in, in our lives today, what feels oppress, oppressive to us may be forcing us, while it may be oppressive that we can't meet with a thousand people in this beautiful church may have forced us out on the Zoom where we can reach people that may not feel comfortable coming to this church. It may have forced us to put more time into the food pantry or helping people who are, are down and out. And those are the people who maybe we can't reach them here. So beautiful. God is so beautiful in how he works. All things work together. So, here's our nameless baby here. I thought that picture was so cute. Annabella, do you want to read this? Um, since you haven't read this morning. This is from uh, Acts of the Apostles. I thought it was, it was really beautiful. Go ahead. 
It was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. The name was given to them because Christ was the name, main theme of their te- preaching, their teaching, and their conversation. Continu- continually, they were recounting the incidents that had occurred over the days of his earthly ministry when his disciples were blessed with his personal presence. Um, untiring, untiring. Untiringly. They dwell upon his teachings and his miracles of healing. With quivering lips and tearful eyes, they spoke of his agony in the garden, his betrayal, trial, and execution, the forbearance and humility which, with which he had endured the con- contumely? contumely and torture opposed on him by his enemies. And the godlike pity with which he had prayed for those who had persecuted him, his resurrection and ascension, and his work in heaven as a <coughs> meditator, mediator, mediator for fallen man, or topics on which they rejoiced to dwell. Well, might the heathen, heathen, call them Christians, since they preached Christ and adjust, and adjust their p- prayers to God through him. Okay. I just want to reiterate to you guys that God chose this name. God chose to write on his baby church, Christians, because they exuded Christ's love as his ministry had pierced their hearts. And it wasn't just telling a story. It was full of emotion because it had changed their lives. Just a story. It's a testimony. That's right. Okay. We're going to look at a couple of other. Um, would someone just open up, uh, grab, you want to grab Second Kings uh, 2, 1 to 15? Okay. Braley, um, why, don't you, why don't you grab Genesis uh, 41, 25? And we're just going to look at these stories real quick. Annabella, why don't you grab Daniel 1? And Daniel 3. And Charlie, uh, Daniel 2. So let's go back to 2 Kings 5.15. Does anybody, can anybody guess what that story was about? Oh, uh, Naaman. Did you find it, Isabella? Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, So, Isabella, do you feel comfortable enough to tell this story? Just... Just tell, just s- yeah. summarize it. Uh, so, so Naaman, Naaman was the general of the Syrian army. Right. And he had leprosy. Uh huh. And then, so like he, he was probably he didn't know what he could cure him because like, but he prayed because he had an I- they worship idols, so he right. prayed to the idol. And then there was a servant girl from. Jer- she was Jerusalem in a, or Judea. Yeah, she was an Israelite. Yeah, and then so then she told the. She told his wife, like, if only he would go to the to the prophet, and and he would be healed. So right. he went to the prophet Elisha, uh-huh. and then his servant told him, go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, right. seven times. That's right. And then he got all upset because he's just like, I thought he would have come out here and spoken to me himself and said he wants me to go and wash in the Jordan River. He could have told me to wash in any other river, and then his his um the guards that went with him told him like if Elijah if Elisha had told you to do something really difficult surely you would have done it right. but instead he's telling you something simple like washing in a river seven times why don't, why don't you why would it, why won't you do it so he ended up doing it and he got healed that's right that's right so captain Naaman more than likely was on the army raids that went and stole little maid from her parents how would you how would you guys feel if someone came and stole you and took you to another country and forced you to work you're just randomly walking to the walking to the park probably and you're kidnapped and then forced to work yeah Yeah. so so that um she could have been bitter but she had her parents had taught her about the love of god And she shared that with the family of Captain Naaman. And she changed him. She changed his life. Did a lot of beautiful, thank you for telling, did a lot of beautiful uh, 
uh, portions in that story. So many lessons there. Braley, uh, did you look over your verses real quick? 41, 25 through 40? Do you kind of see a story there? Mm -hmm. what, what story is it? It's the story of when Pharaoh asks Joseph to interpret his dreams. Okay. And so how do you think that fits in with our story today? Um, because Pharaoh was trying to give Joseph the credit, and Joseph was like, no, give God the credit. I Amen. got it. I got it yes. from God. I didn't get it from my own, from my own self, but from God, because He is Almighty. That's right. And Joseph, did he start out life wanting to go to Egypt and work for Pharaoh? No, no he basically had no choice in the matter. He was no. his own brothers sold him. Yeah. yeah, we have a theme of random kidnappings here. He wanted, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he w well, we're, our next ones have random kidnapping <laughs> themes too. He wanted to be with Benjamin. He wanted to be, really, he wanted to be with his family, but his family didn't want to be with him. But he wanted to be some. with Benjamin and his, some of his some family. Of his family. But he was true in times of adversity, and on his lips were a theme of praising God. On his lips were a theme of a God that is bigger than the, than the disaster that's happening in the world. Even before the disaster, Pharaoh didn't even know the disaster, and the disaster there was another famine. So, <laughs> so another person. <laughs> so the second theme here is spreading God's word to different countries through adversity. Okay, our next one. Annabella, did I ask you yeah. to do that one? So what's our theme there? Um, so it's the story of Daniel, and it's... Specifically in the third chapter. Let's, let's pull over to the, that one. And, oh, it's um, the story of the gold statue. That's right. So what happened there? Just tell us real quick. So Nebuchadnezzar, he was like, after he heard the interpretation of his dream, he's like, I don't want to be just the head. I want to be the whole earth. I want to rule the whole earth. That's right. So he made a golden statue, and he told everybody um, to bow down to it. Like every important person, he brought them all together, and he told them to bow down to it when all the instruments played. But um, the three friends, Daniel's three friends, um, wouldn't bow down to it. So the king, he was like, I'm going to be nice to you, and I'm going to give you another chance. But they already knew that they weren't going to do it. And if they died, it would be for God. And if not, um, it would just be for God also. That's right. And so he threw them into the furnace, and there was a fourth person in the air, and he said it was the Son of God. And That's then he right. them out. Right back there. The so whole point is that they were also kidnapped. Yes, they were also kidnapped. What must have been an ironic point to them is because they heated the furnace seven times hotter, and when they did that, the guards that were doing it died, yep. yeah, they yet they did not. Yep. Braley? He was so hot-headed that he put them in a hot place because he had a hot head. <laughs> That's right. So, so would the king have had such a cra such a... Um, remembering uh, such a um, strong uh, way to meet Jesus if these, pe if these three worthy Hebrews had not stood up for God. I'd also say on a side note, even though, even having met Jesus in person, seen his glory for himself, Nebuchadnezzar still made some huge mistakes later in life, even having met Jesus and seen Jesus. I'm glory. guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. Sometimes, sometimes I stray and say, Jesus, what was I thinking? That's the beauty of Jesus. Jesus is ready and willing to bring us back because he's a high priest that's been tested exactly like we have been tested. So he understands. But the good thing is none of us have had to been abandoned to the jungle to live like animals. That's <laughs> right. Like he did. That's right. In that story, there's kind of a pattern that like, Daniel and three, his three friends are like really close with God and That's he right. talked with them every day. But it seems like the devil wanted to get rid of them. Oh, yeah. Because first there's the lion's pit, now there's this, and then there was like the test for like eating meat. Yeah. So and imagine the devil's point of view. He's throwing them all the curveballs and they're all hit. Yeah, the devil definitely wants to separate us from Christ. 
Okay, so so once again we have three um, followers of God, Christians. They they were Christians, right? In the, in that fiery furnace, they were Christians, standing up and telling people in adversity. Okay, Charlie, kind of look over Daniel two forty six and forty seven, and five thirteen and twenty nine. Tell us what story we're talking about there. Just 46 and 47? Chapter 2, 46 and 47. What story is that? So Nebuchadnezzar fell flat on his face and bowed before Daniel. And Daniel said, your God is God of kings and lords and stuff. And gave God a bunch of titles. And then the king promoted Daniel. And Okay, now yeah. jump to 513 and let's see what story you've got there. Uh... So Daniel came in, and the king, after his dream and everybody had failed, Daniel, or no. Oh, yeah, so this is when the new king comes in. It's, I think it's Nebuchadnezzar's son. And he's there, and he's drinking from all the goblets. And then suddenly this writing comes up on the wall, and so everybody fails to read it. And then... The king's wife says, well, it's okay. There's a guy named Daniel who can do the impossible. And so then they call Daniel, and he asks Daniel, are you one of Daniel of the captives from Judah and the one who I've hear heard that the Spirit of God is within? And so then he tells him, I have heard that you are them, and now the wives men, everybody has been brought in, and they have failed. And he said, I have heard you, and you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. And he says, now if you can make the writing known, then you can have a great reward. And Daniel says, Let your, keep, keep your gifts and give gifts to another, and I will read it for you. And so he tells the king that the king that his father was great, and he reads it, and then... He says that the king was weighed and yeah. found wanting. Uh, kingdom has been divided, and that uh, one more. Basically, he delivers God's message to the king right there, and he doesn't want the robes. He doesn't want the gifts. Just delivering God's message. But Daniel had a reputation of being one that talked of God, being one that that had a connection with God. To the so point that even. The king's wife, even believing in pagan gods, still this man That's literally, right. like they called him, having the spirit of God in him. That's right. So in other, the other stories where he was praying, where he's in the lion's den, in all of these stories with the food, Daniel stood up for God and he represented God. Okay? Because Once if you interpret someone's dream, that's probably going to stick in the back of the some people's minds for a long time. That's pretty important, time. especially if you get it right. And you're that's not right. going to stay quiet about that. If, that's if you right. get the dream completely right, and it's a dream the king cannot remember until you say it, that's yep. a huge deal. So once again, another captive standing up for God. Um, one more quote here. It's, uh, this is from also from Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 16. Before we read that, Braley. Can I read it? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. The cause of God in the earth today is in need of living representatives of Bible truth. The ordained ministers alone are not equal to the a task of warning the great cities. God is calling not only upon ministers, but also upon physicians, nurses, corporateers, and Bible workers, and other consecrated laymen of very talent who have a knowledge of the world of God and who know the power of His grace. To consider the needs of the unwarned cities, Time is rapidly passing, and there is much to be done. Every agency must be set in operation that present opportunities may be wisely improved. Okay. So in this time, in this tumultuous time, um, where our church doesn't have enough money to, to uh, they've had to make some cutbacks, and there's still a great need to tell the Word of God. She says, um, 
consecrated laymen of varied talent who have a knowledge of the word of God. I tricked you guys this morning. In our four stories, I had you open the Bible, but I had you tell the stories from word. And each of you, I could see each of you on your couches at home at family worship time and your parents telling you those stories of little maid, of Joseph, of Daniel. And you had that knowledge of the word of God in your hearts. I heard you guys tell those stories from your perspective and how you had heard them. And that's the beautiful representation of God that our world is starving of, starving for today. So, consecrated laymen, English is crazy. You guys know it means lay women. You guys know it means lay children. The consecration comes from the Holy Spirit. So you guys have the power to go out to people who need to hear about God, about the beautiful stuff that God's done in times of disaster that are relevant today. I just love how God works. Don't you guys? He's so faithful. Okay, final thoughts. Even though, even in these tumultuous times, our church is stronger when we work together. Even though we can't join hands and hug like that. That's right. Yeah, we can't do that. Uh, feel grateful when, our, when your church family can support you, just like this, the early Christian family traded support. And take every opportunity you can to support your friends and church family. I encourage you guys at home, pick up the phone, call, share what God has put on your mind from his word, what he's doing for you today, and use it as encouragement for others. Next week, I hope to uh, see you guys again next Sabbath. And our story is going to be Strangers Among Us. And we're going to look at how Paul takes people who are outside of the family, who don't know about Uncle Bob, who don't know about Christ, and he who tells don't the whole know, story. and he finds ways to enlarge that circle and bring them in. It's such a beautiful story because God wants us all in heaven. He died for each and every one of us, and Paul finally gets that. Can I say a final thought? Sure, absolutely, Brady. So, um, the family of God is like a magnet. It draws people in. But, you know, if, have you ever played with trains and you turn the train around yep. and it pushes the train back? So the, the leaders, the biblical leaders, they, they're like the backwards magnet. They push you away from the family of God. And you ha that, that family of God has to be a strong magnet to keep it together. And so... Be a magnet. <laughs> yep. And, and you, some, sometimes when people, when they get a little cross with the church, they get a little angry, that train car does get flipped away and it drives them away. But God tells us that if, if, if we, uh, that if he says train up a child in the way. Teach, train up a child in the way. And that's why we, even that's if why get, even if they do your parents have told you these stories. If you do stray in the future, if there's someone who strayed, those stories cannot be taken out. And God will use his Holy Spirit to draw back in. And when that magnet gets flipped around, just remember God has a bigger magnet above the church that powers the church's magnet. And it's always pulling people back in. Don't ever give up on people even, who look like they've left. Even yes, if Charlie. they get flipped around, they can honestly still use a friend, even if they don't think they have any need Absolutely. for the Bible, they can still use a friend. Absolutely. So uh, we have an exciting lesson ne next week, and, and we'll, uh, we'll open that one. Can't, can't wait to do that with you guys. Um, still, if you want your guide, you can go to guidemagazine.org. If you need the physical copy, I think we still have some in the, uh, in the deacon's office door right there where Charlie and Annabella are. And I think that's usually open when the church office is open. Um, so that's the end of our lesson today. I thank you guys for being here so much. Would anybody like to pray? And uh, pray. Braley, would you like to pray and ask God to help us, help us tell others about him in ways that are unique to our upbringing? Go ahead, Braley. 
Our gracious and heavenly Father, thank you that we get to meet together even though we can't fellowship close together. Um, help us be that magnet, the magnet pulling people closer and um, help us to learn something new every time we hear these stories and um, be with us as we go home. Help us travel safely. Um, and we love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, that's the end of our Sabbath school. I can't wait to be back in the Sabbath school room with you very, very soon. Until then, we'll see you next week. God bless you.